Every day is upside down day in Sonti Land. Hi, and welcome to the Sonti Land Show, where everybody's upside down. And today I have the pleasure to talk to Seb, who has been inspiring me for a long time. She essentially went from teaching French at the school to being an artist and a director and basically doing the things she loves. And uh, I had a conversation with her already last winter for the Handstand Press magazine, where we went in depth about her transition to becoming an artist. So we won't go in depth about that today, but we're gonna talk about the project she's working on that she has received a Circus Project Award in 2021. And um, she, before that, she got a grant that um, Ignition Residency to work on that project. And yeah, so welcome, Seb. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about that today. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for having me. Really happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to give the people some context about uh, how you got into handstands and what your relationship is to handstands. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, so um, I started handstands about, I'd say, seven years ago now, more specifically, but I used to do gymnastics um, as a kid and then as a teenager in my early teens. Um, and I seem to remember that I pretty much like stopped gymnastics as an adult, but my dad reminded me that uh, I, every time he sees me, I'm upside down somehow. So for him, for example, from the outside, it's just an interesting outside eye on your own development is that it seems like it's actually never truly left me. Um, so there, I think there's something that's really deeply ingrained in me that that type of movement, that type of state uh, just really suits me for different reasons. So when I started handstands uh, seven years ago, it was also through meeting the juggling community, like the circus community in Ireland, but specifically juggling. Um, so I went to a lot of different juggling conventions and I really discovered the whole uh, world of <laughs> obsessive minds trying to land tricks and do reps and reps and reps and sets of the same um, pattern of whatever movement that was. Uh, ob obviously for jugglers, it's object manipulation, but there were other um, people who were doing things that were maybe a little bit closer to what I would do. So hoop, for example, um, hula hooping, uh, balancing things, balancing clubs. And I, I just saw a lot of, um, I just found a lot of joy and a lot of, yeah, just passion in, in doing that. And they just really showed me how to train and how to uh, embrace the passion and really like dive in. Um, so I would say for me, the one of the major um, yeah, starting factors was to meet that community and to be shown like how, how that could become a skill, a discipline, uh, an outlet for expression. Um, and then very quickly, I realized I was getting better at handstands. And then I realized that I really wanted to perform. And so that took a while for me to understand um, whether that was possible. <laughs> <laughs> whether I would get to the point where I can control the handstands enough to, um, you know, not be affected by the nerves on stage and that sort of thing. Uh, and also just develop like an artistic mind around it. And so that's actually for me when I realized that I'm first and foremost an artist, um, an image, image creator, um, you know, vision maker. And I use handstands and the body and photography, which informs my work as a hand balancer um, to, to, to make art really. So my angle is, I think we, we talked about this before, uh, you and I, like my angle is, is very much from the artistic um, yeah, perspective and then the discipline, the body, the you know, athleticism um, comes second when I have to make a, a choice or a decision and that's, definitely been a big part of how my project Fleeting has come um, along. Um, there has been, there was a point where I had to decide, do I want to keep training the skills um, and 
put that that project on a shelf, um, you know, until I am at the level where I, I want to be? Or is that what I want to do is to go ahead with the skills I have now and just, just you know, put that, that, project, um, that project out there. So that's what I decided to do because for me, it was like a no brainer. It was like, I have this vision and I want to create it. And that has to happen with the body of skills that I have now, not in five years time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know so and how did that vision come about for you where did it all start um well because I am an image maker what I mean by that is like I think in images I have um my creativity my creative brain is never off like I'm constantly seeing images wanting to create more you know photography is a big part of of you know, my artistic outlet as well. And so I think very quickly when I had enough skills in handstands, I just was obsessed with lines and shapes and what the body looks like upside down and then what that could evoke in terms of emotions. And I wondered, why do I do handstands? Like any hand balancer, I think, you know, ask themselves at some point, especially if you're into artistic creations, you're like, why am I doing this? It's so absurd. I'm standing on my hands and I only see the floor. Like I was just reading the Hands on Press magazine where uh, I can't remember her name now, but like the last article she gets into all this. Um, yeah, you probably remember her name. I just read it now. but <laughs> Yeah, uh, you're talking about uh, Creta? No, the very last article. Oh, uh, Marion. Marion. Yeah, Marion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she describes it really, really well. It's like that state of flow um, and what that evokes, you know, for the body and the mind. And then that kind of got me thinking about um, my my own personal, like, grappling with existential questions, uh, finding meaning in yeah, really the everyday life. Um, And I'm quite obsessed and fascinated by the ephemeral, for example, transient states um, and the fragility, the vulnerability of those states as well and stages in life and how much we go through that every day uh, and also over the course of different phases in life. Uh, And I just realized one day that that's actually what a handstand, that state of balance and flow encap- encapsulates for me. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the main reasons why I get into it is like that, that feeling that at that moment of balance, I am grasping a little bit more closely, uh, maybe an answer to those questions um, that I can't really put into words that has to be embodied Um, And I think that's the search and that's the obsession. And that's also what I find personally extremely calming for the nervous system. It's something that really grinds me, uh, you know, literally and and also psychologically speaking. So so that's so that's a long winded uh, like explanation to about the the sensation and the draw like the yeah, the calling for exploring more what that means and what that can look like artistically. And so then conceptually, I wondered about how can I now express what I'm feeling in my body? How can I convey that on stage and talk about the fragility and the ephemeral and that maybe that illusion of a a quest that is to try and grasp that moment that you by definition can't because true balance to true equilibrium does not exist as we know it's constant you know flow so that's how i started looking into different things the first thing that came to mind was the lines of the body and just creating shapes and forms and movement that were very um, um, um i want to say so embodied that it doesn't necessarily make sense so it's like very raw And so I started painting, you know, with body paint, um, my body with UV paints and I use a UV light bar to see what those movements could create and what kind of impressions that could create. And it were very simple shapes like attitudes and changes. And, you know, I didn't want it to be gymnastics or ballet, like I'm not a ballet dancer anyway, but, you know, 
Um, and then little by little, I moved away from that and I found a, a material, like a prop that actually suited that idea of vulnerability, fragility, or the ephemeral much better. And that was uh, chalk. So the, the type of chalk that you use uh, in gyms or in gymnastics, um, because you can break it up and then it transforms into powder. Um, and mm -hmm. it's very versatile and you can, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, so I started playing with that in different acts. Uh, I was in Brooklyn for um, the Raising the Bar intensive program with um, The Muse, uh, which is a really nice uh, circus uh, training center in Brooklyn. And that, that was the first time where I used the chalk simply really just simply to draw a circle on the stage. And that circle started, you know, representing the bubble and the outside world and the existential questions. But that act was also a dance trapeze act. And it was really baby steps into um, trying different things, see how the material reacts. And then every time you do something and you bring that into an act, you walk away with something new or something that you can discard and then you can um, focus on or refine your vision. So there has been many steps actually um, to get to where I am now, which is uh, basically using chalk as a pre-setup on stage. So there's like chalk and powder. It was like probably about two kilos <laughs> on stage. Um, and the first thing I do as part of the show, which is called Fleeting, which is a 30 minute piece um, solo, um, is to, without revealing too much, but it's applying the chalk on the skin um, as, a, as, as a sort of very eerie, um, unusual uh, introverted ritual um, and it is yeah it, it holds all those all those symbols for me and then and then the movement sequence starts and I go through uh, a few different sequences uh, stages like to portray that that journey around around all those questions so the first time I ever started thinking about the word fleeting and trying to portray all those those sensations and those concepts that was probably um four years ago now when i started playing with the the uv light uh, and when i was in brooklyn um and so it took it took that long for me to realize actually what it is that i want to say how can i say it uh am i ready let's go let's apply for funding um create material create um videos and you know research it and show show the work on you know so it's a, and, it's a long process <laughs> yeah and it's super interesting to me because there are so many parts involved not only from your your own uh experimentation of you know creating the content of the project but also the outside, the administration part of all the things with making other people understand what it is you're doing and kind of conceptualizing everything in a way that people can understand it. Um, how does I'm not, that- And I'm still, like I'm not, uh, some, uh, sorry, I'm still not sure that actually is the case. Sometimes I'm amazed, I'm like, am I making sense? How did I get the funding? Because. <laughs> You know, I'm like using words and, you know, sometimes I very often I have that moment where I'm like, how did that happen? Like, why am I, how did I get to that point where my job is literally to roll, you know, on the floor into chalk and but you know that existen existential stuff while I'm doing handstands. <laughs> it's just the Yeah, point. <laughs> well, you know, the first time you, you told me about it and then I looked at your, your trailer and all the things that you told me about uh, the existentialism and just the fact that we're all gonna die, everything is fleeting. And, yeah. you know, we got into that and it was just like, you had put something into a visual um, expression of something that everybody can feel and everybody's scared of deep, deep down. That's mm, what I felt yeah. like. It's like this thing that we all know, we all know that, everything's going to pass the finite element of and we lives. live in a world with 
uh, finite resources. And we're at a point in our history as human beings right now where things are mm -hmm. kind of shaky. And um, I think it's very timely what you're doing. Yeah, well, it's universal, isn't it? It's like literally can't really get more um, like closer to the human, you know, experience uh, that curse and that blessing that we have to be aware of our own our own condition. Um, so I suppose what I'm really trying to do in my life and through art and it just happens to be hand balancing. And I don't think it just happens to be hand balancing. I think hand balancing has like really like holds those those traits like in a way that maybe other art form don't. Maybe it's very personal, but that's kind of what I'm thinking at the moment is that kind of reconciliation between um, that, that awareness of myself and the state of flow and actually living the life that I have, that I'm lucky to have and not being in the thinking mind about it. Um, and so hand sounds for me is but movement you know but hand sounds in particular I think because of the the uh, like laser focus on balance uh for me is that that like near perfect um opportunity to like be okay body body and mind one you know is one uh, which is something that I struggle a lot with for a lot of things. So embodiment uh, has become a big part of my life um, in other ways as well. Like I have practiced um, somatic therapy for uh, a few months with um, a therapist last year um, because of that, those questions, like that, that feeling, that sensation of being disconnected from your body, not being um, not being able to really listen to what the body is saying and being being hyper functional, but at, at a very intellectual um, and rationalizing level. Um, and I think intuitively, that's why I started doing handstands, because it, it really instantly gave me that, whoa, OK, here I can just be like I can I don't have to I can I can. It's one of the moments where I can switch the brain off um for a little bit um so so yeah i think mm -hmm. the existential topics for me uh, are super super intertwined with hand balancing and you know i might i might um at some point leave that alone and explore other things uh that might be a little bit more specific but straight away like that really like just imposed it's it imposed itself uh, for me that that was the topic that was the most relevant mm -hmm. for me to explore uh, and throughout the pandemic, I have to say, like, it's, I considered myself extremely lucky that I had already developed that practice for myself because everything was so unsettling. Um, and because I had already devoted so much time about thinking about why handstands are so important for me, realized all those things, started my project, the vision, and then just developed like a, a very regular practice. Uh, it really, really helped me um through through that time so so yeah just so back to your initial question about the ad administrative like aspect of things um i think that's a super uh important part of the life of the artist um is to realize what um what is the the art the, the status of the artist in society and where are the spaces where we can exist where are the spaces and the structures that can support us uh, and then really get our shit together and, and, and make time um, to, to, to get those opportunities. And that's, that's, yeah, it's a lot of admin. It's a lot of like understanding how the system works because the system um, has its own, its own um, rules or its own, um, reason or you know the criteria for a grant for example like who's yeah. going to get the grant uh you really who's have to yeah everyone has something that's worthy but like why is that artist going to get it and not that other one and like you, you really have to like put your best foot forward and understand the language of 
the yeah that system to to get recognized and then try and try again and again until mm -hmm. until you get it uh which can be extremely disheartening um because it can not happen for years and then and then you get that lucky residency that had to make a great trailer and then from that trailer you're able to show the arts council that you're serious about your project and then you're trusted with more money and then you can actually make you know a show mm -hmm. um why do you think you yeah. sorry to interrupt you but no, why, why do you think you were granted your support so the first grant I received was a bursary award that was, uh, so that was in 2018. And that was to develop my practice and my art. So there was no um, uh, obligation to um, produce a, a show or anything like that. Oh. And the reason why I got that first funding, which opened the door to more, um, you know, bigger opportunities, I think was that I was able to show um, quality of work uh, in different ways. So consistent training, uh, I had already dabbled into performing and I had videos that were high quality to show it. Um, I had photos that were really good. Um, and I had, you know, what you need, like a bio. Um, and I didn't even have a website at that time, but I had a Facebook page, which I was, um, you know, quite regular, regularly updating and using to create my courses as a teacher as well. So I think I think I just like took it really seriously and, and decided to to invest like I had to invest money into good photos and shoots and things like that. Um, so that was the first also, at that time, there were very, very few hand balancers in Ireland. Um, so I think it, it gave me an advantage as well, like within my discipline. So within circus and within my discipline, I think we were underrepresented. Represent, uh, so I also think that was a particularly lucky time uh, for me to start, you know, start my practice and start performing. Um, and then, like I said, I from that, I was able to secure a residency with Dublin Circus Project and Dance Ireland, um, which gave me the opportunity to work with a mentor uh, to develop new movement vocabulary for fleeting. So it wasn't about making a show or a choreography. It was literally just, okay, we've got the chalk. We might play with UV light. We're not sure. We need two weeks to explore and see what embodiment means you know, in this context and what we can come up with. Um, and so that happened in September um, 2020. Uh, yes, 2020. And no, yes, 2020, sorry. <laughs> Getting mixed yeah, up with I everything that we happened. Met, we met afterwards for the interview and you told me yeah, about it. Yeah, it was, it was postponed um, because of the pandemic, but then we were lucky to be able to make it happen in September that year. Then things had reopened just enough uh, for us to be able to do that residency. And within that, those two weeks, I, so we actually worked so fast that we started making a show without realizing it. I mean, I'm sure Megan, Megan Kennedy, who is my director, I think she, she definitely saw, saw that happen. Uh, but by the end of the first week, we were already seeing some um, distinct movement sequences emerge. Um, there were things that we, like imp important questions that were resolved, you know, like the UV light didn't work. It was all about the chalk um, and just really practical things like that. And that week is when I applied for the Circus Project Award. Um, which Megan helped me greatly with. Um, so Megan is a, a choreographer, dancer, and uh, director um, of Junk Ensemble, which is a, a contemporary dance uh, company in Ireland. Um, and she helped me understand what was needed for that bursary or that grant. Um, and I applied for it that week within five days of discussing it with her. 
um, and without her help, it's clear as well that I, I don't think I would have gotten it. So like, it's also another thing is like, when you are an emerging artist, you do not know what you do not know. Right. You don't know, you don't know what is the standard. Like I never been to school uh, in the arts. Like I, I didn't go to a circus school, didn't go to a dance school. I have zero clue, uh, you know, what a, a get in or get out time means in terms of a performance. Uh, I mean, I didn't. Um, you know, like you're asked to apply to things, to shows, to festivals, and you receive questions that you're like, I have absolutely zero notion of what that means because I'm not, a, um, you know, a trained professional. Like I'm, I'm a former French teacher who has just, you know, embraced the opportunities, but there, were, there has been times where I was like, ah, I have no idea what's required here, you know? So that's why that residency, the mentoring in that residency was absolutely instrumental for me to be able to like secure further funding and to um, just up level, you know, to understand. And so with the grant that I received, the Circus Project Award, um, as part of that, I have been able to work with a sound um, composer. Uh, so a sound engineer, music composer, uh, lighting, engineer, a costume designer, uh, my director, a production manager as well. Um, and all those people are so like, I mean, their level of professionalism is just outstanding. And they have been, I mean, they have literally taught me so much just by communicating about their, their craft or their field. Um, and now I understand a lot better what goes into a production and what is mm -hmm. needed, you know, a year ago, I had zero clue. And I made a lot of mistakes in that process because, you know, even though you're well-intentioned, you're like, so I'm the project lead in the sense that I'm the artist. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but there, there was, there has been many times where I've been like, I don't know what's needed to move on, you know, to move forward from this stage, like what's, you know, and so you talk with people and you tell them, it's the first time I'm producing something like this. So you like, feel free to tell me that, you know, I'm not making sense or I'm not seeing something that's important that, you know, needs to be dealt with or whatever. Uh, but even so you make mistakes and, and um, uh, well, it's part of the, it's part of yeah. the process. Yeah. It sounds like you've been going through tremendous growth in the last year or yeah. so, or, I don't know, probably last four years. <laughs> yeah, this, this past year in particular, it has really sped up uh, massively, which is really uh, mind boggling in the sense that, I mean, we stood still for so long, this first half of 2020. Um, the, the whole year 2020 has been like, was so, so weird in that sense, like the uncertainty, yeah. the question big questions like because I had that grant and then I was like but I don't know how and when I'll be able to use it and then for months and months festivals were like yeah we're gonna try and push to open and then and then finally some festivals were like no actually we can't we're sorry we can't go ahead and so like you're awarded you know a few <laughs> like a good few thousand, you know, to make a show and you then wonder how am I going to use that efficiently and in a way that can make my work go a long distance uh, in a pandemic when no one can actually see my work <laughs> or where yeah. everyone is taking a huge wild bet on when things are gonna open again. It's really nerve wracking. Um, and so my experience yeah. of up-leveling in that field is completely, um, yeah, like just enmeshed with the pandemic. I, you know, I, I think I've had a really stressful year in that sense. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah, it's been extremely uncomfortable at times, um, but overall I'm struck by how much in the sector of the arts in Ireland, um, you know, especially, I mean, it's the only thing I can talk uh, about is like everyone is, is really trying to, 
to to be to be thoughtful and to be you know yeah thoughtful and supportive of one another um, and try to communicate and be flexible about um, the constraints in which we're finding ourselves like I'm really like on the whole like really positively impressed by um, the work ethics of so many people that I've been I've been in, in contact with um, so on that front like on in that sense like I'm I'm like ecstatic I'm really happy to to have been you know I mean I'm super lucky anyway I'm like really really blessed to have been able to focus so much on that on that particular uh, show uh, but it's also been a great experience meeting the sector like who is actually um, who are the professionals and uh, yeah just a uh, Mm-hmm. giving me ideas and motivation for other other projects for the future as well yeah. so how is your outlook for fleeting right now what's like the what are the next steps for you so fleeting is gonna uh premiere actually in august uh, no way in, where what right? yeah, yeah yeah i didn't know that <laughs> In Waterford, in, in Ireland, there is a festival that is called uh, Spree. Uh, so it's spelled in a weird um, <laughs> Gaelic Irish um, way, uh, which is S P R A O I, but it's pronounced uh, Spree and it means play, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a really, um, really well um, established um, street art um, performance uh, festival um, in Ireland. So it's been going on for, I think, since the 80s. Uh, and they're very famous for um, huge installations, um, huge puppets um, with, you know, super intricate installations with lighting and different effects and and um and you know uh people in them you know you using or um uh what you call it operating in them uh but also the festival itself uh brings in a lot of people from abroad and um like a lot of artists from ireland as well and it's a it's a it's an amazing uh festival for for the yeah, street arts so this year they have a slightly different offering they're not going to go um and do the just you know the exact same uh program that they would just because of restrictions and you know travel restrictions are still a little bit up in the air in ireland so there's going to be five companies uh that will perform in the city in waterford um the first week of august and i am one of the five artists um that will perform And then the second week of August, there are five more companies that will perform, but uh, outside the city on the Greenway. Um, And that will also be a show I will perform there with uh, my company, Feathers Ensemble. Um, So it's a company of three and we have a different show. So I'll be performing twice uh, at the start of August, which is mental and I'm just back from Glasgow with Feathers Ensemble as well where we performed our show in the city still um, for Surge Mm -hmm. Festival so it's been mental because everything is like was completely still for a long time and then within a few weeks everything like started happening and started moving forward and then you then you find yourself with like nearly too many (laughs) too many things and, and you're mm-hmm. like, can't say no, but can I do everything? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you um, don't know if lockdowns are going to come back with the Delta variant and whatever is going to happen. So, yeah. So fingers crossed that this is all going to go according to plan. Uh, my parents are coming. My brother is coming. <laughs> wow. To see the show. So It sounds super exciting. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like a breakthrough moment. Would you say that? I think so for me yeah and like the the stakes are are quite high for me because um it's literally the first um real production that I'll you know that I'll be um putting together and so yeah we'll see how it's received um I I love the show I'm in love with so many moments that I think really 
capture so well like the the sensation the feeling the emotions um but how it translates for the audience and how it translates into an outdoors um setup whereas initially fleeting was more you know conceptually it's 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 really designed for uh, like a black box theater type of thing because it plays with lights and you know darkness a lot uh, but it mm. will be evening time outside in August and so it won't be full darkness it will it will be you know dark enough like dusk twilight type of darkness but definitely the lighting designer um, is gonna have to um, take that into account and, and make it work uh, which I'm sure she will because she's fantastic um, and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how that's going to be received in a slightly different not that I've performed it before in the way it's you know designed initially um hopefully you know next year when things are back to normal um if they are you know next year in terms of indoor um setups but you know at some point it'll happen I'm not I'm not too worried about that I'm just looking forward to putting that show on and seeing so you haven't tested it at all, even with people in your circle? No, uh, like I've had a full run through with my team and we have filmed it as well um, recently to create a trailer. Uh, and as part of that, we ran through it uh, a couple of times. Uh, but I haven't had the opportunity with the restrictions and, you know, everything like to actually have more than, you know, an, like a, an, yeah, it was like a tech rehearsal, I suppose, with a full um, run through that was also being filmed. Um, so, so yeah, we'll just have to see how it goes Exciting on. Exciting times. So right now, the main uh, challenge for me is to keep up with the, um, physical demands of the show uh, because it's a 30 minute solo piece and as part of that they are um, there's yeah they're like one particular moment where a lot of handstands are happening in a short amount of time um, and so that with the chalk with all the movements with the music with you know everything else um, mm -hmm. it's actually really interesting and quite tough to see how much stamina is is required uh, to be able to like perform, I'm not gonna say comfortably, but you know, in in the zone of you know you can nail it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And because it's the first time, and because of the year we've had where we weren't able to like train as much and be it wasn't as easy to book studio time and, you know, like actually do the thing. Um, Cause it's okay to do handstands in my sitting room, but I can't do my full show in my sitting room, you know, mm. I, I need a lot more space. So, um, Ooh, how do you, so how do you practice it then? Um, well, that's it. Like you have to, you have to book studio time. You have to make the most of the time you have and find other ways to keep your, your you know your fitness up uh so that when when you're back in the studio you're not like starting from scratch um because you know you know yourself for handstands there's a level within which you can kind of fall into maintenance and that's okay and within mm -hmm. that level if you take even three weeks off you know you might have a few days of like hard um you know, it might be a bit tough, like going back into things after that, but you get to that level again quite fast. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm talking about is like performing. Um, yeah, that that level of stamina and and endurance is something that if I'm if I'm not at it every week, a few times per week um, and I, I take two weeks off, I'm literally back to square, you know, minus five. Um, and that's a level I, I am mm. at at the moment myself. Like, I'm sure that if I had, you know, a, a five or 10 year uh, career in, in um, you know, performing at that level, it may not be that way. But for me, that's where I am at now. So, 
So that's the main focus now. Like the performance uh, will start on the 5th of August. So I have, yeah, just short of three weeks. And I'm like, okay, it's doable if, if, I, stick to, mm-hmm. if I stick to the plan. So I'm lucky to have um, a couple of uh, spaces I can train in um, and that I can, I can just run, run my sequences enough times to you know keep keep the body see this is why this is this is why you're such an inspiration to me because you're just like (laughs) do it do it do it you're amazing and I might I might (laughs) you know I might like it might not go I mean I am at that point where I feel like it's doable but just about so I am taking (laughs) I am taking, it's not like, yeah, I got this, fine. Uh, I think I got this in terms of if I overshoot a handstand and I flail about the stage, I think I can catch myself gracefully and tie in with the rest of the performance, you know. Uh, But I'm not at the stage where I'm like, yeah, this is all, you know, nailed. And no, there's a big, (laughs) there's a big risk taking element in this but to be honest with you I think that that's also part of my personality I think that you um, like the jitters I it's really a funny one because I'm a perfectionist in many ways and in in some ways I can be completely stuck in that perfectionism and like really paralyzed and not move and look at things unfold and be like this is a train wreck waiting to happen why am I not doing something and then like you know, it takes me a lot more pressure to actually get moving. Before performance, like performing in particular, I am not so much of a perfectionist. I'm more, I'm more able to trust the flow. Um, and I think that that is because I am first and foremost, I go on stage to connect with the audience and to convey emotions and I believe that my skills help me do so but I don't believe that a perfect routine you know like gymnastic competition style I don't think that that's going to move anyone it's not going to move me anyway yeah Um, yeah you know even if I nail my own performance completely technically I'm I'm going to be like yes but I'm not going to be like that was something, you know, that actually touched me. And so I think that that's the reason why I'm able to go like, okay, it's a bit risky. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't be even saying any of that, like uh, <laughs> super trailer no, I totally for, get it. for you, my show. <laughs> the but, essence you know what I mean? Is, yeah, totally. It's the essence that you want to bring across, right? And it's not, the skill is not the essence. The essence yeah. is what's behind it. Yeah. And so, I mean, to put things in context as well, uh, like I'm quite unlikely to overshoot a handstand at this stage. So my entries are because I I picked that example, but it's actually not really representative. Like my entries are pretty solid, but the endurance is sometimes still, you know, catching up with me. So um, when you fatigue and when you're in a long hold and moving, uh, obviously there's a, there's a, there's a risk of losing that balance, um, not to the point necessarily of actually losing the handstand, but enough that it might interrupt the, the sequence itself, uh, you know, that you may not go through all the shapes that you wanted to go through in that particular handstand. Um, and yeah, there are a couple of entries that are still a little bit challenging for me and, I have a rule that I'm like, okay, I can, if I fail, I can try twice. I mean, I can do it once. If I fail, I can try once more. And if that one doesn't land, um, either I change the entry completely or I move on because you have mm-hmm. to have those. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it depends. It depends on the moment. You can't really have a, a very set plan because things are going to be different um but yeah I think that that's also part of the the game (laughs) and um having talked with 
people who don't do circus, um, who have been part of my team, for example, who come more from dance, for example. So they may not be familiar with handstands, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I've sometimes said things like, oh yeah, that handstand, I completely, I completely uh, failed the entry. It was so all over the place. And I've had people tell me, it was super impressive. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's also there, I think there's a lot of space for, you know, to be found in those moments of feedback for hand balancing artists or circus artists and like in general, maybe um, is that the, you're your, we are our own, you know, worst like critiques most of yeah. the time. I was just going to say that. And if we're like super, super focused on the skill itself, uh, personally, I think we're missing, we're missing something important in terms of like, yeah, connecting with the audience and yeah. how the audience is going to see what we do is completely different to what we see. And at the end of the day, sure, you want to do handstands and do impressive show, you know, impressive physical skill sets, of course. The wow factor of circus is, you know, is contained in those moments, but um, the public doesn't know, like the audience doesn't know what's difficult. Like, you know, right. the money maker yeah. when you start handstand is a straddle handstand. Or a croc. Yeah, I mean, I can't <laughs> do a good croc, but like the straddle handstand has always been the easiest for me. And it's definitely the one that has at the start, you know, like, Mm. made people, people like happier. oh she has a split yeah exactly and like and and you know if you do like I don't know a pike after that they're like mm. okay <laughs> but the straddle you know? mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> or straight yeah, totally. just a straight handstand is 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 harder like sometimes yeah. than a straddle like you know so anyway so yeah. th those when you realize that you're like oh so then you have to reconcile okay so I'm performing for the audience. I'm not performing for me. I mean, I am performing for mm -hmm. me too, but, you know, how am I going to use the skills to express what I want to say and in a way that is going to be compelling and interesting and also relatable because I don't know, I love like Cirque du Soleil artists. They're just unbelievable. And also they're like superhumans who I can't really relate to. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Do you know? So yeah. like, it's like, wow, the level of skills is just mind blowing. Um, mm -hmm. But then I go home and I never think about it again, you know, whereas yeah. if I'm, if I'm, you know, if I'm seeing, uh, you know, contemporary circus artists um, who is able to to make it relatable, like to my level, you know, whatever it, the discipline, yeah. that's, I think that's one of the main challenges for a circus um, now. I mean, one of the challenges that interests me anyway um, is to make, to make things more relatable for people. You know, that's the main thing is like, I want, I want people to, to be touched, to be moved and to go home with, new images and, and a, a different mapping of, you know, their human experience, if possible. Yeah. If, I, yeah. if, I, if I can manage that, you know, in a split second here and there for everyone who's, you know, going to see the show, then, then I'm just really happy. Yeah, it, it bridges the gap between you know, the superhumans and just being the normal human, there is so much in between and it helps people to broaden their own horizon and discover their own potential and what they themselves can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. Yeah. And like in the show, like, I hope you can see the show one day because like now we're talking about it so much. Uh, but um, in the show, there are a lot of movements that have come from researching embodiment and what that meant for me specifically was what are the movements that live in my body already right now? Not what are the movements that are impressive and that I can stylize to put into a choreography. It was more about really like to try and, and 
uncover um, natural, like deep down, coming from a very, you know, deep depth. <laughs> Uh, more of an unraveling of what's already there yeah because that's where you'll find the most um authentic you know the, the mm -hmm. real authenticity and then sure i can then you know train in contemporary dance and i can continue training handstands and i can do all those things floor work and stuff to to then bring that level of authenticity to a level of you know higher skill level physically mm -hmm. speaking but right now I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in finding where, like, what are the movement, the movements that live in my body and where, you know, where, where are they and how can I tap into them on demand? Like, you know, when you're on stage and you're like, okay, I need to embody this. I need to not be, okay, step one, step two, you know, like, yeah. no, I want to be yeah. in that flow. That's what I'm trying to do is to find that flow in the handstand and try that, to find that flow in other movements and then create something that will, you know, convey how I feel about the ephemeral and all those things. And so some of the movements in the show are in terms of technicality, they're not te technical at all. They're uber simple, uh, but they're very compelling because of the place it comes from and because mm -hmm. of the you know the layers of symbolism and embodiment that that they carry and I find that process extremely interesting like really fascinating yeah. uh, and sometimes I go into full like self-doubting mode and I'm like what are you doing how is that interesting to anyone but you and like why like <laughs> uh. how really you know and then and then I try I try to like you know disconnect from that voice straight away because it, it's that's just you know it's well just and also <laughs> to me what you're doing is like the most interesting thing in the world you have Whoa. seriously <laughs> been the biggest source of inspiration for me for me it it <laughs> manifests more in music as we already talked about but yeah it's it's the being relatable yeah and giving the like showing showing a path that is possible and showing mm -hmm. that you don't have to be something you're not yeah to, exactly. to put it very blunt so you don't have to and also it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> and and the beautiful thing is that you have these official supports as well. Like you have institutions standing behind you supporting what you're doing. Yeah. So, so your work is in, very important. Yeah, well, I'm in Ireland. We're, we're so supported. Like, I don't know what it's like in other countries. I don't know what the, the bodies are that can help artists. But in Ireland, we have, so the Arts Council is doing an amazing job at funding like so many artists and more and more every year, uh, you know, circus is growing. The, the amount of artists mm. that get funding every year is, you know, I, I can see it. I can see it in people around me, like people who are, um, you know, coming from a hobbyist background and like really up leveling towards professional um, uh, practitioners and artists is, is definitely noticeable like it's uh, significant even um, but we also have uh, a body that is called uh, ISAX which is Irish spectacle um, and street and circus arts I can't remember anyway if you look it up it's ISAX um, mm -hmm. sorry about that guys I am really bad with <laughs> acronyms uh, but basically what they do in ISACs is advocate for artists um, and be like a mediator sometimes between uh, you know all the different um, agents of the sector so you've got the festivals you've got the arts council um, you've got you know bookers programmers um, and then you've got the artist and they're trying to get the artist to connect better with all of those things to understand how the sector works and how to 
um, showcase and how to be present and how to be visible and and how to just make better um, you know bring bring higher value type of production um, to to the table and literally Lucy Medlicott who is the CEO of Isaacs is the person who's going to ring you one day and say literally like I'm not joking she'll, she'll be like Sev I've seen an opportunity like it's for you you need to apply for this now like the deadline is today at five so like stop what you're doing you need to do this now you know oh, cool. and, and she does that with you know all yeah. of her members um like you know I used to think I was her favorite but actually it turns out that no she does that with everyone <laughs> and so oh, cool. it, you know she's like she's like our big sister of the arts that um has our back and like gets gets us in check um at really essential times and writes like it, like really important support letters as well uh, that we can then you know put into applications so like I listened to her from the start. Like I met her, I signed up, I became a member. And then straight away, I was like, okay, if Lucy thinks, I do. I do what Lucy hmm. thinks I should do. And I know like that, that has been very, like just really essential to, to my development and my understanding of the sector as well. So going back to, you know, what you were just saying now about um, being yourself and going for it uh it's it's super true it has i mean that's authenticity lies at the the heart of arts you know the art like i think i i think that's the reason why i'm in love with the arts and circus as well like it's just there's no way around it it has to come from a place of authenticity and originality not that we can ever make something truly original and new but the fact that you as a as your own unique being with your unique um you know outlook on things and your everything that you are like you will give its own twist to whatever it is that you're doing and that that's worth a lot you know yeah but but without support and without structure and without funding you can still do a lot of things, but yeah, it's a lot harder to, to, to get the visibility and to, yeah, it depends, depends what you want to do and what the goals are, you know. Mm. I want to bring the interview to a close and I, I want to ask you one last question and that is, sure. is bleeding going to be more accessible after the premiere? Is there going to be a way for people to see it either as in video form or live? Uh, no, not at the moment. Um, I have from the start decided that fleeting was going to remain a live experience. Um, and I don't know like exactly yet where that comes from. I think there is a fear somewhere in me that if I release fleeting as a video, or as a live, you know, online uh, experience, it will, first, it won't be the experience that I want people to have. Um, like it won't, it just won't be. Like there's so, mm -hmm. so many elements of like lighting and texture and sound that won't just won't be the same. And I think I'm mm -hmm. just too particular about those visions to, to be able to let go and be like, ah, oh, yeah, sure, it's, you know, um, so I think I'm a bit, yeah, I'm very protective of that aspect. And, and also I'm very hopeful that like, I'll be able to tour it, um, you know, at some point. So I think I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happier holding on to that for now and not making it overly accessible yet. Um, and so it will be in Ireland this summer and then really hopefully I can tour it next summer. That's the plan. Uh, and if not next summer, because life gets in the way, the one after or, you know, like it, the project will continue to grow. Uh, now, having said that, I have a trailer that is just being finalized now and that will definitely be released. Um, so you'll get to see what was filmed recently in Dance Ireland. Uh, and that I think that will give you, you know, um, a good idea of the, the, the world that I'm in with it. At least an idea, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. 
Uh, I, I really hope I can see it. Uh, maybe too. I can come to Ireland. That would be amazing. Yeah, definitely. That'd be really cool. But you in any this case, August, if you want. <laughs> yeah, well, we're flying to New York mid-August. Okay. So I don't know, maybe before that. Maybe I should look into that. Fifth, fifth to the eighth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, I wish you so much luck and Thank all the so best. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks so much, Sonia, for today. That was really nice to get to talk about all of yeah. this. Uh, so thanks so much for having me. It was really I, cool. I always feel so enriched when I talk to you. Well, thank so. you so much. Like it's it's really it's, it's yeah it's um it's uh, it's amazing to hear. Like <laughs> so. so yeah, 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 yeah. I'll feed you all the praise because <laughs> you deserve it oh, so thank much. You so much. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And to all of you, thank you so much for watching. And don't hesitate to comment down below if there is anything that is still open, if you have questions. Um, and also be sure to check out Sev. We have all her details down below. And it's never too late to do what you love. I'll see you next Monday. Absolutely. <laughs>